Hello and welcome. Jeff Manchester here. Manchester Music. This is a little series I do called Anatomy of a Q, where I just talk about a Q that I wrote. We sort of dive into the guts of it, do a bit of a post-mortem, and I explain all the moves I made EQ-wise. I talk about the VSTs I use, all the sample libraries I use, and this is just to sort of demystify the process. There's a lot of people who come up with stuff and it shows up in a movie and you're like, how did they, what is, what did the DAW look like? So this is a look into that process. So join me as we walk through everything together. Um, and I'm going to play the track. It's called uh, Permission, I think. I just an arbitrary name, doesn't really mean anything, but it's sort of a Pixar-y, lovey-dovey kind of track. So I'll play it, and then after that, we'll walk through everything together. All right, here we go. Okay, so that's the track, permission, whatever. Anyway, um, so before I dive into things, I want to sort of explain two things. First, I mean, have a look at the left-hand side as I go down these instruments. First of all, there's only 11 of them. It's pretty simple. But what you'll notice is not much happening as far as the effects and the plugin game is concerned, right? With the exception of maybe one or two. I want to really hammer this home for people because I see a lot of people in these threads on Reddit and stuff going like, what plugins should I buy? What are good plugins for orchestration? And in fact, I just spoke with a woman not too long ago who's actually like a pro composer and she I'm helping her now uh, just with a couple of questions she has about uh, composing and mixing, mostly mixing because she knows what she's doing on the composing front. But she's asking me questions like, oh, I love Spitfire stuff, but I've heard it's kind of boomy, or I feel that it's kind of boomy. Um, you know, what, what 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 are the best plugins to use if you're using a, a Spitfire library? And to me, that's such a, it's such a non sequitur, the idea that I'm using a certain sample library, therefore, these are the mixing tools I need. Every mix will dictate its own um, tools. You know, you sort of hear something and you go, oh, I think I know what this needs. If you have a pre-baked sort of template of plugins for everything that you mix, chances are you're ruining all of your mixes. Not to say that she was doing this, but I feel like a lot of people feel they need to really arm themselves with a whole bunch of plugins that are so expensive and that, frankly, a lot of people don't really know how to use effectively. Um, you can get away with some really beautiful stuff using the stock plugins or no plugins at all if you're using a lot of the onboard native stuff that comes with instruments that are created for this um, for the um, the contact sort of universe because they have their own onboard effects, compressors, EQs, you know, convolution reverbs that sound just beautiful. This is a very minimalistic track, and I'm just trying to hammer home to you guys that you don't have to break the bank and you know kill your credit card just to get like a quote-unquote pro sound. So with that in mind, um, the other thing that I want to say is for this track, I mean, I really wanted it to sound like it was a little tiny orchestra, like it was very dainty and very sort of Pixar-y. And you don't achieve that by... <laughs> you don't achieve that by over-compressing and over-EQing and over... and just adding plugins willy-nilly. Like you get that by if anything, reducing the amount of, of, of stuff that you're putting on each one of these tracks. Because if you listen to a classic, you know, if you listen to a classical piece or whatever from the BBC or whatever, like a live orchestra, it's going through mics and it's going through a bit of processing probably on the way in and through the preamps adds a bit of color and stuff, but that's it, you know? You want to bestow presence. 
you know, and, and performances aren't perfect, you know, and, and you really have a chance to perfect everything in the DAW. But if you're going for a live present orchestra, like you're in the room sort of feel, you know, the way to, to kill any of that vibe is to overdo it in the DAW and over automate and over EQ and, and just, you know, nothing is perfect. Um, so why strive for perfection? If you want it to sound real, real stuff doesn't sound perfect. You have people, you know, real people with blood throwing, flowing through their veins, uh, playing the instruments, not playing the same notes, <laughs> the same way twice, all the rest of it. Aim for a little bit, a little bit of imperfection, especially when you're doing orchestral sort of music and really, for this track anyway, I'm going very minimal. You don't have to go minimal, but I think less is more. So let's explore with that in mind how I did this. And we're going to talk about panning. We're going to talk about volume. I'm going to walk through everything I did in a very sort of as if I'm talking to a bunch of golden retrievers about mixing because I find a lot of these guys on YouTube just sort of skip over everything that they've done and they don't explain why they've done something or how they got there. So we're going to really break it down. Okay, enough talking. Let's start with the harp here, which really guides the piece and sort of sets the table, so to speak, of the track. So I'm gonna just solo it here. So it's the same pattern over and over, and I don't really have any automation. I just have some sustained pedal automation. It happens right at the beginning, right here. If we're set to 127. I have a sustained pedal at my feet right now, um, and that's it. As far as quantization goes, I was very strict about the quantization. It sounded to me like I wouldn't ruin everything by quantizing it really hard to the 16th note. All that means, by the way, is you basically set up a grid. It can be, as you can see here, uh, eighth notes, quarter notes, half notes, whole notes, in this case, 16th, because that was the pattern I was pumping out. And then I can decide the strength of the quantization, how how hard or how firm I want it to, to conform to the grid that I've chosen. We can introduce some swing, blah, blah, blah. So this sounded pretty natural and normal to me, so I like that. Um, I could have, I guess I could have gone a bit less uh, conservative, more liberal with the uh, the strength here, maybe gone for something loosey-goosey. But anyway, I've got my pan pot right here at 12 o'clock. Option click will set that back to zero. I just wanted it to be right up the center. Uh, my volume, pretty conservative. I'm right at unity gain, right at zero, you know, nothing fancy. Let's go into the instrument, um, which is housed in contact. Surprise, surprise, it's a Spitfire harp. It's the, I don't know, Spitfire conga harp i'm not going to try and pronounce that but um so this is what i'm talking about here you notice i don't have any real there's a channel eq here but i'm probably not even doing anything with it it just came up by default so i'm going to get rid of that um this is what i mean there's all this great stuff that can influence the tone and the character and the quality of of this instrument on board without me having to bring a bunch of crap on just because you know I want to feel like I'm important so I have like eight things in my signal path we have close mics we have a tree formation deca tree and we have ambient that's what these stand for and I've chosen to go really close because I want to pull focus on this heart but if I want to I can introduce some reverb without putting a reverb plugin on here by blending in some of these mics so let's just again get a solo here of just the harp with the close mics Now I can add in the tree mic here and the ambient mic and I can listen to how much roomier they sound. Okay. Or I can just blend them in. I can add this in here and then I can maybe just go halfway just to give it a bit of room tone. So that sounds pretty cool. I like my close mic. I have the release and the dynamics on here. I'm not doing any automation, but I have the releases all the way up. And this is just, well, see if you can hear the difference without me sort of whining on about uh, all the technical stuff. So here's no uh, releases on. Let me bring it in here. And back. So when the release is down all the way at zero, we're not emphasizing any of the attack or any of the pluck, or sorry, we are emphasizing the attack and the pluck of the harp. But when it's all the way up, we add a bit of room 
to the sound, which I quite like. Um, I have a bunch of different articulations down here. I've just chosen normale. <laughs> um, I don't know why it's funny. And yeah, so that's that's it. Like that's the harp. Um, there's no volume automation. Nothing's going on. Just a bit of sustain pedal stuff. That's it. Let's move to the next thing here, which is the string swell. So if I go to the string swell, sorry, I'm still new to Logic, so I'm still not too sure what I'm doing as far as soloing and all that stuff goes. Experienced Logic users might be shaking their heads. If I open up the strings, I've got Spitfire Chamber Strings, Long Flotando, which is probably the most popular and beloved um, patch here for uh, chamber strings. It's just beautiful. So let's have a listen to it soloed. And watch the dynamics and the vibrato rise up here as I introduce more notes. So that's just, it's swelling, it's giving us a little bit of sort of like, ooh, what's happening? Again, we're setting the table here in the first maybe eight bars of the track, sort of just piquing curiosity and interest. Um, and if we click down here at our automation, um, there we go, we can see that, you know, it sort of bumps up a little bit here. I just introduce uh, the MIDI message and then we bring in the automation and the, uh, the vi what is it, vibrato and dynamics go up? Let's have a listen here. Yeah, dynamics and vibrato. Watch them, watch them jump. Now I've chosen the easy mix mic setup here, so watch this little audience. They get further away from the orchestra, or they get closer to the orchestra. It's rather clever visual right there. Rather clever. I have it halfway in between, so. Anyway, that's that. And that's just to sort of introduce um, the string section is to introduce the more percussive key-based stuff, which happens in the Celesta and the Unicorda, which is just a, a piano. So um, a piano I'm quite infatuated with. So next up, what do we have? Oh, by the way, that was also panned here at midnight, 12 o'clock. Volume is at unity gain, zero. We're good to go. We have another sort of string swell, which is just adding a bit of flourish. And here's an interesting thing. See these notes up here? Not notes, but see this uh, this MIDI information? I'm going to explain why I did that. So let's just solo this. No sound, of course. If I open up Contact. So the reason I did that was because I find that if I, if I record maybe, you know, um, one beat away from the, the place that I actually want to record and I do some MIDI automation, Logic doesn't really understand that, even though I have a pretty powerful rig. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll wake the automation up here. I'll say, hey, I'm about to do some automation. I'll wake the controls up, and then I'll put them back at zero. And then when it's my time, I'll add some automation in there, in this case, dynamics and vibrato. And this just saves me from having to redo the part, because sometimes if I do it the first way, the way that I mentioned before, um, it doesn't catch the, the automation, or it catches the automation, it spikes it at 127, then it goes back down, so it's a bit of a mess. So anyway, I've chosen this trill, major second trill, so we're just going up, um, uh, well, this patch is going up, what's the word for it? Um, I'm forgetting the word. Anyway, the distance between two notes. Oh my god, I'm tired. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Interval, we're going. <laughs> the interval here is is a minor second. So anyway, that's what that is. And it's really simple, um, you know, very tight release uh, and expressions all the way up. It's just, expression is just another form of volume. It's just a sort of... Um, it's almost like the gain staging. So we have our master volume here, expression, dynamics. Anyway, that's all the way up, and this is halfway in between, and we have unity gain here. No panning or anything like that, just very simple. And the reason I do this stuff, guys, the string swells and all that, you'll see some stabs down below, horn stabs and stuff like that. This is just to keep the audience interested. That's all it is, just to keep them going, ooh, what's going to happen? What's, you know, little flourishes. That's all they are is flourishes, and those need to be there. Absolutely need to be there, especially if you're doing all this in the box. Uh, you can't have long sustained notes all the time. That'd be like a like a weird John Cage nightmare. So let's jump over. I like John Cage, but anyway. Um, let's jump over to Unicorda, which is, I'm just infatuated with this thing. Very delicate. It's happening on the left side here. Well, I've, I put a lot of it on the left in the panning, in the stereography. It's very delicately played. 
This is what I would sound like if I was a piano. I'd be pathetic and weak. So, you know what I mean? It's just very soft, very relaxed. I didn't do too much quantizing here. You can see the things aren't... Um, oh, I did a little bit of quantizing. They're, I was going to say they're not conforming totally to the grid. And there's no... Um, there's just some sustain pedal stuff here. There's no real um, automation per se. But one thing I want to point out is listen to this beautiful physical sustain pedal sound that we have from this instrument. See this little block here? Just have a listen. Ah, I love that. I think that's so gorgeous. So anyway. So again, that's at Unity Gain over here. Let's take a look at the actual contact instrument. Una Corda here. I've gone with the basic felt snapshot, which is just a fancy, their word for preset. Um, there's nothing, I don't have any of the space or any of this stuff on. Um, I do have the releases set here to be fairly lax, so we're really getting, again, that tone, the ambience of, uh, of the keys hitting. If we wanted a tighter sound like we did in the harp, I could bring this all the way back, but I quite liked the um, the releases sound uh, I was getting right from the patch. I'm not doing any compression or anything. Uh, no EQing. It's really very basic. I'm, I was just, you know, really impressed with all this stuff. As, as I said before, the pedal, the sustain pedal, the rumble, the damper, all that stuff is on. So when we, when I, you know, release and when I depress and then release the, um, the sustain pedal. So that's happening there. And this goes all the way over here. I mean, it gets pretty intense at the end. Intense, air quotes. It's here in the mix. Now for the Celesta. Um, I have the Celesta sort of mirroring the unicord of the piano and it's just sort of giving us the shimmery bright high end that the unicord is kind of lacking because I'm playing the unicord in an octave range that isn't very bright doesn't have a lot of high end information it has a lot but it's mostly mid rangey so and I'm also panning it to the right here so we have it a plus 24 cents to the right whereas this one's to the left so they really complement each other they fill each other out which I I gotta say is more fun than EQing everything so nothing's hitting anything else. I, I will always reach for the pan pot as opposed to grabbing an EQ if I feel that things are masking one another. And if I really can't deal with that, then I'll go into Isotopes Neutron and uh, see where things are hitting each other, which is such a friggin' helpful tool, uh, by the way. So um, let me just solo this. You can hear the Celesta. By the way, it comes from Native Instruments. Um, and it comes from there. If you guys, if there's any complete owners out there, I, it doesn't matter what state of complete you're in. Um, I'm at 10, but you can go in. Let me just find it here. Go to the library. Okay, it's here's how to get it because I love it, and they've really swept it under the rug. You have to dig hard to find it. Orchestral percussion. Um, no, it's not there. It's Legacy VSL. And then you have to go down to percussion and then, no, where is it? Mallets and bells. There it is, Celesta. So you have to really dig to find it, but I think it's beautiful. They got rid of a lot of the tone and the, and the potentiometers that came with the previous version of it, which kind of bums me out, but whatever. Um, I spruced it up with, uh, well, actually, the channel EQ isn't doing anything. There's a tape delay. I, I mean, I had to add this stuff just because it wasn't, nothing was happening. Nothing was happening with the, um, in the contact version. They stripped away all the um, adjustments you could make uh, within that, um, that box, so. So just, I don't know, it just gives it a bit of space. And I have it sending to this little space echo here. This is the most intense sort of heavy processing I do and I have this going to yeah, so they're they're going to a series of um, of reverbs as well they're just both fairly conservatively sending uh, to those buses so anyway that's why I have the volume really low because a lot of processing is happening here so it doesn't have to be as loud as everything else if that makes sense 
Um, and then the notes very much just mirror each other the entire way. She hears the break. And then we go back to the upper registers. Uh, we're in 6-8 time, by the way. That's kind of fun, kind of different. I usually write everything in 4-4, four, four, but it's good to challenge yourself, right? Uh, what's next? We have some pits strings, pizzicato, and this is our bass. And I have this band up the middle. It's as mono as it's going to get because it's bass, and that's what you want, or that's kind of a rule of thumb that I follow, is everything bass-wise needs to be mono no matter what. If you're in Ableton, grab that utility plug-in, suck out all the stereo information, make it mono. Now, where did I get it from? Chamber strings. Again, staying small with the orchestra. Small little chamber string orchestra. Have a listen to it in solo. Pizzicato setting here. And this was quantized pretty hard. I kind of wish I hadn't because I think I would have, in hindsight, like, you know, you ever heard that expression, a mix is never finished, it's just abandoned? The same thing is true of, like, a movie. It's never done. You know, you know I, I hear stuff now, especially as I'm doing this video, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is going out to the world. I wish I could change that. I'm not going to tell you what I want to change. But, um, yeah, I, I should have been a little looser with the, with the quantization. I'm still getting used to Logic's quantization stuff, but it's very flexible, and I should have really taken advantage of that. But bottom line is it doesn't sound like a robot was um, plucking the strings on the double bass, so I'm pretty happy with it. But that's it. It's just going to follow the rest of the instrumentation very carefully. And also, this whole track is very percussive, right? We have the celesta, the unicord, the harp. It's all Everything's getting plucked, so... Uh, that's kind of a thing that I do a lot. I don't like big sustained stuff. I'm, I, I guess I, I was a drummer. That was the first instrument that I played was the drums. So I sort of still in my bones. <laughs> the next part the violins the high violin that these guys have these guys toked up before the session get it anyway um so for the violins we have again spitfire chamber strings and now i've increased the room size here i've increased the real estate <laughs> of the stereo space of the anyway um i have close mics i have uh the tree formation on i'm not doing any ambient stuff but there's a lot of automation here well a lot for this track which is pretty automation light and um listen to what i mean here so i have this we're gonna go now again we wake up the automation here when i'm recording like hey we're gonna do some automation don't screw everything up and then i play again with my two fingers on the dynamics and vibrato. So watch those two go up and down as I solo this. Here we go. Right there. more automation I wake it up again because I recorded this part later now this could have been a bit cleaner it's kind of embarrassing but anyway um, so yeah, the, it's very f like you can tell I didn't go in after and redo all the the uh, the MIDI automation. 
uh, or sorry, the um, the dynamics and vibrato automation to make everything much smoother, which I should have done. I was under a bit of a deadline for this film, but there it is. So every time, if you notice here, if you go down to the MIDI, I mean, do you notice something here? There's peaks and valleys. And we go down to the valleys when we introduce new notes, because again, imagine you're bowing, um, you're bowing your violin or whatever, um, and every time you change to go to a new sort of chord structure, you know, maybe you will ease into the full sound of those chords or those notes rather um, every time you change, right? So not everything is the same. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to emulate the physicality, the physical nature of a violin player through the automation. And this is in an effort to, you know, add some realism here. And I do that by, you know, every time we have a change, we could sort of bend back down and ease back in. Uh, until we get to the full sort of attack of the note. So that's just a little automation sort of um, rule of thumb that I do all the time. So it's important also not to be too over the top with it, like wow, wow, wow. Like it's just that that can get kind of annoying and that's good for dance music, but not really for um, orchestration. So anyway, that's the high violins. Again, unity gain, no compression, nothing happening here. There's a, there's just a ton of compression already baked into these samples, I think. And uh, we've got you know, no reverb because I've got a great, a great room sound in my view for the for the which really serves the track. So anyway, next up, we have Sato, Wood Woods. Let me go in and see what this is here. Yeah, so this is uh, this is Sato Woodwinds, the Woodwinds patch, and I think this is just to add a bit of texture when we get to the break. So let's have a listen to this on the solo. Those let's see what let's see what we hear. Yeah. Oops, we're over. My bad. We're over here. So, I mean, this is just me putting my triad down and going out for lunch. The cue is done. No. Um, but if we go into the guts here of Sato, let's take a look at the pan. So the high stuff is sort of over here, sort of halfway to the center on the left, center for the mid stuff, and then the, the base stuff is sort of at the right. That's the panning, that, the kind of pre-baked panning that it comes with, so I've left that just alone. Yeah, and I mean, everything's sort of at the same volume. I really loved the patch right out of the box, so I just sort of left it as is. But I do have it panned a little bit to the left here, and this was just a, a decision I made on the fly. I like the way that it sounded in the mix. We have a lot of other things right up the center, and I wanted this to be a bit different from, from all those guys. So um, next up, we have another instance of Soto Woods. I think this is, yeah. So this is actually strings. It shouldn't be labeled Woods. Labeling is important, children. I'm gonna change that right now, just in case my mom checks on it later. Um, that makes no sense. Let's go back here. So, yeah, so this is just to add a bit of tension because we get to a bit of a break there with the Celesta. It's going boom, 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 boom. Ba da dum, ba da dum. Very delicate, very relaxed. So yeah, so that's that's that. I mean, I just love this uh, this patch that Sato came, uh, well Sato came up with. Which, by the way, I can change if I just click on this O. I'll get different variations of these three elements here. And yeah, I just just loved it. And it's going right up the middle as well. And it's just adding another layer of sort of gloss and beauty to uh, the final passage here. We've set the table and now everyone's eating, if we're going to stick with that metaphor. Uh, next up we have some flourish here, and this is, I think this comes from Orchestral Woodwinds by Sonokinetic. That's my impression of the guy that does all the walkthrough videos. I'm sure he's a nice guy, but uh, anyway. Um, so here is some panning automation happened. I know for sure. We've got the pan here. We go, I think, extreme left and then extreme right. So have a listen soloed. So I guess it's right and then left. But anyway. So again, this just adds a bit of interest. 
um, to what's going to happen. And we have short trills, major, and a bunch of different. I mean, this is a very complex uh, key switching system that I love. But anyway, just short trills, just to sort of accent the other stuff that's happening further up. So if I go back and hear everything in context. Anyway, next up is Sato uh, Woods again. And remember I was talking at the beginning of the video about introducing mistakes and physicality and imperfections into the mix? Here's a classic example of one because this is a sample li uh, a phrase library that was designed to be played essentially in 4-4 time with some exceptions. There's some fun stuff you can do. Uh, for example, if I open this tab, I can play with um, <laughs> the offset feature and we can that'll change the, the sample start time. But all this to say... I'm in 6-8 and this is 4-4. Four, four. See if you can hear what I hear when I solo Soto Woodwinds with the, uh, not Woodwinds, but yeah, Soto Woods, I guess, with the um, metronome. See if you can hear what I'm getting at about imperfections. Here we go. So if you listen very carefully, right around, I guess, bar 30 or 31, we lose the plot a little bit with the beat. That's because, again, these are not written, this was not written to be played in a 6-8 piece. It, we can get there, part of the way there, but then we kind of collapse when the math doesn't add up. But here's the thing, I'm okay with that. And it doesn't mean you should be too, but I'm okay with that because if everything is perfect, then it's not real. And... Maybe if I was in a big studio recording a bunch of people doing this, someone might do that. I might ask them to do it a different way, but I would keep that recording, and maybe that recording, that version of it, would be more interesting, you know, or more real than the one where they played it perfectly. Or maybe, you know, we just can't get them to play it perfectly, and it comes out like that, and that's just, that's life. I, I want to introduce those kind of mistakes and that kind of realism into my my cues because I feel like that's what separates them from the perfect machine gun, everything comes out one after the next, marches, you know, marches right down perfectly. I want I want mine to be different, unconventional, and physical, and sort of real. I want people to feel like this came from a real live orchestra, and it didn't. Well, it, it, it did at one point, and now it's all MIDI. So I'm just saying it's okay to have those little mistakes in there. And if anyone tells you it's not okay, then just... Look at this thing. It's the middle finger. Just give him the middle finger. Huh? See that? Whatever. Anyway, um, that's kind of it for this. I have a limiter here on the master bus, and that's just to make this this track loud enough for this video. Typically, I'd bounce this out and I'd master it, which is what I did. But just for the sake of this video, I wanted to make sure you could hear all the instruments sorted together uh, properly and my voice at the same sort of volume. But that's it. This is really what I want to hammer home is... is don't feel you need plugins. You, It's more important that you know what you're doing with the plugins than that you own a whole bunch of them because any DAW now comes with a bunch of great native plugins that are just beautiful and functional. And I mean, anyway, so just don't feel you need to arm yourself to the teeth with gizmos and gadgets because chances are you're just going to make everything sound worse. And when you have enough experience doing this, you're going to listen to the track, you're going to listen to how it was recorded, and you're going to know right away if it needs something or not. And then you're going to add five other instruments in there, and then you'll know even more if it's going to need anything or not. You might think it needs something solo, but in the mix it's perfect, but maybe it just needs a little bit of something. I don't know. Which actually brings me to this last point. This little something that I thought this instance of Sato Woodwinds needed was the Clarifonic. So I just brought that in. It does parallel equalizer. It's just It just adds a bit of sparkle or something like that. If I solo it, maybe you'll hear the difference it's making maybe you won't but let's just go back to this moment I'll turn the measure off did we catch the midi we didn't catch the midi big middle finger bypass I mean, for the sake of this demonstration, we'll just push these things a little harder. I'll go down to, actually, we'll go, yeah, we'll go here. 
So unbypassed. So you hear the difference there. Now, one recommendation I'd make specific to people who own the Clarifonic, it might sound great soloed and it might sound great once it's in the mix and everything, but I swear the trick to using this thing is to find a place where you really love it and then dial it back halfway and dial it back halfway. After two or three listens, you're going to notice, oh my gosh, I overdid it on the Clarifonic. And all you really need is maybe up to here, maybe up to 10 o'clock on the focus and clarity. Uh, because you'll play it on someone else's speakers and it'll sound so tinny and shrill, especially if you've put everything through the Clarifonic. Now, that being said, do whatever you want. <laughs> it's just something I've noticed, a little tip there. Anyway, so that's it for this breakdown slash anatomy of a Q. Hope you learned something. If you didn't learn something, uh, I don't know. But hope you enjoy this. I'm going to make a whole bunch more. There's a lot of new songs to uh, to do these sort of videos for that I've written. And yeah, thanks for stopping by. Leave a comment. I read every single comment like uh, it's crazy. Um, I do a thing called the vodcast where people write in if they have questions about mixing, mastering, producing, whatever, and I'll be happy to answer those. So vodcast podcaster at gmail.com, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Take care.